thank you, Vanessa, and, and thank you, Ben, and, and thank you, everyone, and, and thank you to the crew. Uh, I'd like to start uh, with the question, and, and a wide open question. Um, of course, everything is open to interpretation, and the concept of ethics was, is, and will always be as open as ever. Uh, but I believe what we understand of ethics is different uh, to what people understand of ethics. And by people, I like to uh, get your thoughts specifically on the new generations. Uh, what I believe to be a very interesting generation, indeed, the generation that was born with the internet, lived their social lives on social media, uh, then came a climate crisis, um, and of course, a pandemic. It's a very interesting generation indeed. A generation that inevitably, one way or another, is entangled with technology, uh, whether they are consumers or they will participate in creating technology. And a technology that I believe in digital products and specifically in the world of retail has one thing in common. And uh, what I believe it has in common is that it tends to objectify the consumer, it tends to see the subject as an object of use that can be known, that can be uncovered, predicted as a simple, lifeless thing, right? But of course, this is very dear to us, but what, do this, what does this new generation think of this? Uh, uh, is that something relevant to them? To them? They see it. They look at this documentary Netflix, uh, uh, Social Dilemma, with a friendly concern, but does it go beyond that? And I'd like to start with your thoughts there, Jill. Yes, it is an interesting question. Personally, I'm not sure that the generational effect is, is uniform. That's uh, definitely not my experience. Uh, I think that these are concerns that we'll find in every age group mm. and also paradoxical behavior in every age group. You know, uh, in terms of uh, not only across the age group, but even in terms of individuals within the age group of, of saying they're concerned about uh, giving data uh, and yet quite merrily using uh, tools which if they stopped and thought about it, you know, are obviously uh, collecting data uh, upon, it, upon them. So, yeah, for me, I, I guess, I see the generational thing as, as less of a, a, a driving force and, and maybe more uh, people's uh, outlooks and their circumstances and their, their experiences being what, what drives people's uh, opinions on these things. Very good. Who wants to follow on that? Um, <laughs> no, I, I was just, um, I'm just going to say, I think it often comes down to uh, the age-old question of a value exchange of I want to use a product or a service and as a result there's some sort of give and take in there. I think for me the, the, the challenge becomes and is becoming stronger is uh, individuals having sufficient visibility and transparency around what that value exchange looks like. So I think Certainly, I find you know, my teenage children, they understand what they're getting, mm -hmm. how well they understand what they're giving and where that's going and what's being done with it, I think isn't as clear. And so I think sometimes that ease with which they engage with those products and services, um, maybe because they don't have the transparency and visibility that they ought to. They may not want it yet, but they may not know. Yeah. Do you agree with Giles to an extent? I, think it, I, I don't think you can split it by age. Mm. However, mm -hmm. uniformity and conformity, when you look at how the younger generation conform, is based around their acceptance in digital space through the number of likes, follows, et cetera. And that's what they mm -hmm. deem as popularity. Mm -hmm. And so they're conforming to a system they're not actually in control of as such. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very different. That's very different in the society that I grew up in. 
yeah, we can form in much smaller communities, for the better word, the more established forms, whether you agree with them or not, of hierarchy, right? Whether it be religious, whatever it may be. But now it's based around, as I said, popularity on likes and so on. And I think that's very different. That is very different. Uh, and they're not actually how far they can influence that is debatable. Um, so I think that's what's different. That, and that is, I would say that's generational. That, without a doubt, in my head, that's generational. You, you say that, I'll talk about myself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm driven by those things as well. You know, I want, if I put something on LinkedIn, you know, you I'm happy when it goes, <laughs> yeah, so I'm not sure, yep. you know, isn't it, more, isn't it more a 2021 thing than, mm. you know, it's driven more by the world we live in? Not, I don't, not, certainly not, not, not in the community, I, in, in the people I, I converse with, no. Mm. Um, I, I don't deem, if I look at our daughter who's 10, um, she will, if she's looking at Minecraft gaming, she will, she will look at how many followers that person's got, right? Mm. And that's how she's going to go on to it. I don't, for me, that just doesn't come into my mind. I, I, don't, I don't really, I don't think at that level. That's not, that, that, that to me doesn't necessarily mean that I would necessarily see that as an authoritative voice, yeah? Because mm. I want to really establish with the individual and connect to the individual and really understand the, the individual's values mm -hmm. before I make that conscious decision. Um, she's not doing that. She's doing it purely based on the popularity of that individual by the number of likes that individual's got or followers they've mm -hmm. got. And that is different. Yeah, that is different. Um, now, I'm not saying it's, I'm not, question, I'm not questioning whether that's right or wrong at this point. I think that's what we need to debate. Yeah. But for instance, when I was young, I, I relied on the traditional media form for that yeah, and, and other forms of hierarchy for that. It's very different now. Yeah, um, that, 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 that's, that, that, that's, the, that's where I think there is a difference in the behavior that I'm seeing. Yeah. And this, yeah. And this does, that, does, does that make sense, Charles? Yeah. 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 And this uh, um, idea, um, is not so much generation, uh, but the drive uh, that you might have. I, I adhere my, my thinking to that. The idea of an exchange, but it's unbalanced or unaware, uh, and the idea of compromise or conforming, sorry, mm. conforming to uh, that value. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, the agreement is on uh, on the how simplified that is, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, you you wanted to share a thought mm. there. Thank you. Yeah, just to build on, um, on, on, on the excellent comments um, from the previous uh, uh, speakers, there's, I think there's many dynamics at play. When, when I look at my kids, they, are, um, um, they, they see tremendous value in, in, in social media, not necessarily the same social media as what we are using, and they use it probably differently uh, from my, my, my outdated use of Facebook, for example. Um, they, they, they are very good in hiding their identity, it seems. Like they're much more conscious about some of these threats than what we believe, what we give them credit for. Uh, at the same time, they are probably more naive on sort of like the, the kind of like the manipulation of the feed mm. that they see. They, it's, it's it, it, you know, when you're like 15, you're not necessarily thinking about the sinister <laughs> corporations, uh, 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 for the lack of a better word. Do, doing things uh, on the background. So there's, I, I think there's, it's a very dynam, dan, dynamic thing. And I'm just kind of thinking that is there like a generational, are there generational differences? Or, so like even if we look like way back, I think there's this a really great book if, that I want to mention by Helen Nissenbaum called Privacy in Context. It's a fairly old book already, but it talks about sort of like how people have always shared and they, that, that privacy is not kind of like keeping everyone out of your life. It's about being in control of mm -hmm. the way you share mm -hmm. information. So it's not the sharing, it's the inappropriate sharing. It's not the use of what you shared, it's the inappropriate use. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think they're, 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 you know, kind of like the older you get, you get a bit more skeptical on sort of like, what's, am I the product actually, or what's happening here? When you, and, 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 and those are probably the kind mm -hmm. of like some of the dynamics that are happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Ben or James, want to add to that? Yeah, I, I guess there's a lot that we've just <clears> talked <throat> about. Um, coming back to your original question, I think there's a objectification happening with people, which is almost part of the technologies that we're using. So um, just on the base level, you know, we are using, you know, zeros and ones, and we're, we're having to kind of squish, you know, information into a form that we can 
produce amazing kind of predictive technologies that we can, you know, fill your feed with things that you maybe want to look at, you know, and provide that service. And for me, it's always coming back to, you know, what are those bits of information representing and respecting that as an individual, respecting those people. And hopefully, you know, as you're talking about the more insidious kind of use cases, you know, we have seen um, companies utilize, you know, for research, real life people, thousands of people where they are just changing, tweaking a small thing and getting a response. And when the price to participate, you know, you know, I'm talking to this generation, this younger generation is, you know, being on TikTok or whatever it is, and you'll get penalized by your peers if you're not doing certain things, you know, there is a price to be a social being. Mm -hmm. um, and some, some of that is participating in certain ways. Um, you know, the, these organizations have a lot of power to, to make those tweaks and to, you know, change how people, um, how they feel and how they behave. Um, so I think that's like, for me, you know, when, we're at, when you go into companies and you, you're consulting and talking about these things, it's just incredibly important to, I guess, you know, bring that back to the respecting those people. Yeah, I think, I think power is the word I'd probably pick up right. from that. And to your question about the generation, I probably agree with Giles in some ways that it's a 2021 thing. But, you know, if ethics is the question of what is the good life, and I think most people fundamentally would like to decide that for themselves, mm -hmm. they need autonomy to do that. And every generation or point in time will negotiate that mm -hmm. with the sources of power in their lives. Mm -hmm. And in 2021, that largely is in the digital world for many of us. And particularly, I guess, this is where it might come down to younger generations that a proportion of their lives, probably greater than older uh, generations, will be lived in the digital space. Mm -hmm. And so there's the sources of power with which they're negotiating their autonomy and thus their ability to live their ethical good life are in the digital world. So that's probably potentially what's different for them. Exactly. And, and, and this. James and Ben, this thinking of, you know, we assume mm. that what's on play, it's what's in the data. Mm. And you're talking about uh, evoking in the companies and the processors and controllers of this data an awareness that these consumers hold feelings and they have an ethical balance that they pursue, etc. But that is not in the data. Mm. Mm. So narrowing down, cutting down on all those, that you know, wealth of things that are not constrained in that simplification, mm. right? Mm. So that brings me to my next question. And I'd like to start with you, Mika, because um, I, I, I love the, the analogy of the mobile number uh, as an association to an individual that is portable, right? And there is a recognition, a decision that was made to understand that that is something that belongs to a person, regardless of the company that controls it. Mm. And that decision was not data-driven. Mm. That decision was ethically or responsibly or socially, you know, and whatever the moral concepts that participated, right? So now we shift from the new generations to the company's uh, views. How do we as companies that we represent or views that we represent uh, bring into our organizations that which is not in the data to make decisions, like for example, uh, uh, mobile numbers uh, portability? Right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good, good, good and excellent question because the, the ethics is such a elusive concept and what's the yardstick uh, so the, the 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 one of the problems for for the company that I work in um, uh, is the scale of things so the, there are too many things happening all at the same time that may have an ethics dimension so uh, dozens of AI projects for example or big data analytics cases how can we use this data for this and that purpose so so then when you you, you a com traditional way for companies perhaps to look at it is to measure the risk that an activity poses on the company. Mm. But we, we kind of like uh, try to move away from that a little bit 
uh, uh, through a, a concept of human impact assessment mm -hmm. uh, uh, to create sort of like a consistent, relatively fast, standardized measurement mechanism, methodology for for people like me to to quickly engage on a, on a topic and try to understand the impacts on the on the human. And you may you may question like why would we do that? Well, GDPR has actually driven some of it, but it's also about a value-driven company, I guess. So we basically have a framework where we, which is based on the Human Rights Convention. So it's about rights and freedoms of individuals. I have a lawyer's background, so it was easy for me to start thinking this way. Uh, and then when you look at human rights conventions, they kind of like start from the right to life mm -hmm. and, 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 and not to be physically harmed and mm -hmm. things. So that's where we also start. So kind of like basic question like, what we're doing here, is it likely to lead to someone dying? Very thankfully, that's usually not the case. Uh, 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 but then we have a long list of sort of like harms that we try to measure a particular activity against. You, somewhere on, on the list you would find things like embarrassment or nuisance or, or discrimination or right of uh, employment or whatever. And, uh, and then we kind of like try to map sort of like different scenarios and we try to get better in it. It's not it's, it's certainly not perfect, but it helps to, to start having these discussions with the business stakeholders who, who to whom some of, you know, their, their, their objectives are, are sometimes slightly different from, from, from these kind of objectives. But when you bring this, kind of, uh, this side of the narrative to the topic, I think most people will resonate with that. They will, because we are, we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are employees and we are human and we are parents and everything, so it's kind of, it's helpful, helpful dialogue. I think, mm. the, again, to pick up on a word, human is the word really that's important. Mm. And, you know, I think with data, it's easy to look at the power and the potential. And, you know, it's often thought that data is objective and that it's going to sort of give us a clear mm. way to chart through the messiness of everything that's human. And I think that the important thing is that we don't forget the human and that we continue to invest in all the human mechanisms we've built to sort of negotiate between us all these all the all this messiness mm -hmm. and that we you know whether that's democratic institutions or you know all, all the other things that they need to sit alongside this um i guess as as kind of vehicles for that that constant conversation about values and about everything that goes alongside using data responsibility mm -hmm. very good it's human and value driven uh, thought. Who wants to continue on, on that? Perhaps you... Uh, yep. Yeah, I think that, that AI is a tool and it very much needs to be you know, the humans who are deciding how to use that tool. So uh, a while back I was working at uh, a UK retailer that also has an insurance arm. Mm. And I'm a data scientist um, and we're always looking for signals in, in data that can, can point to something else. And there is a signal in uh, how you do your grocery shopping that is, it's a relatively weak signal that will uh, suggest how likely you are to make a car insurance claim. Wow. Um, now, we found that signal and the decision was made and I applaud this, that uh, when people applied for insurance, if they wanted to give uh, their uh, loyalty card number, then their grocery behavior would be uh, looked at. Yeah. And the human decision was, if that showed that they were a lower risk than their normal demographics would mm -hmm. have said, they were quoted a lower price. Mm. If it showed that on average they were higher risk, it would be disregarded and they would have got the price or they got the price uh, that would have just been dictated by their um, demographics. Mm -hmm. So to me, that, that kind of ex exemplifies the fact that you know, AI can be useful, you can get a, you, you can see that, but it has to be humans over the top of it making the decision mm -hmm. of, you know, is that, you know, is that a fair use of data? And I think, you know, one overriding principle that, that I try and ad adhere to and advise anybody to is, are you using the data in a way that people would 
uh, perceive as reasonable mm -hmm. and kind of expected. And, you know, I think that most people would say it is reasonable that if I can show you that I'm a lower risk, that you use that. Mm -hmm. And I think most people would say it's not reasonable for you to be, uh, you know, penalizing me <laughs> for my grocery yeah. shopping or my insurance. So I think that's, and that, that to me is a great example of, you know, yeah, ethics, uh, I'll probably murder this quote. Yeah, it's, it's what you do when you have a choice. You know, so yeah. it's, it's, it's what you do above your legal responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought that was a great example of that and, and definitely you know, and, I'd like and, to see more of. And conversely, we talk about artificial intelligence. There's also artificial stupidity, <laughs> and it's important to note this. And this happens in the grocery world, you know, where you know you draw correlations that that actually aren't aren't true and aren't helpful, yeah, yeah. and create unhelpful outcomes. So you know, the classic one we always talk about was, you know, you buy cornflakes, so we're going to recommend you toilet roll because everyone has to have toilet roll. It's always going to be in a basket. So I think the the issue potentially that we also have is that if people don't have the transparency of how those decisions are being made, then they're not open to interrogation and they are open to artificial stupidity. And if those rules and the logic and the thinking aren't able to be tested and individuals don't have the chance to see what's going on behind the scenes, that for me, again, feels like a risky area we go into and it takes control away from people who want to, to be able to query what's going on. Because it, again, the sort of decision you outlined is it's not whether it's, it's the right or wrong one, but that you can say this decision was made by these people according to these factors, and then it could be interrogated by other people. And it may change over time as well. This is a really interesting thing that, that you know, with um, AI and algorithmic systems, often we're automating decision making. And to do that, you need to kind of bake values into the system. And that's something that happens at a point in time. But values change. And so how do we have processes in place so that we can continually revisit those decisions and continually update them? And sort of that process of contestation and debate, how do we ensure that there are mechanisms in place to make, make that happen in the algorithmic world as well? Mm. This is all great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, that's a really fantastic example. Um, and this kind of view on, you know, taking, you know, a, a view on things which you are starting from the, the position of I'm a human being and I'm going to be interrogating the system in a certain way is just a really great way of thinking about it because you're, you're stepping out of that commercial uh, kind of capitalist situation. You're going, actually... We have to make money. That's that's a given, guys. You know, this we're not going to be here otherwise. Um, so, you know, what's the next thing? You know, if it doesn't make money, you know, we can't we can't do it. So, that's a given. Let's just ignore that for now. Let's think about the human impacts and and interrogate that before we actually do anything. And when we are doing things like, you know, design it for the betterment of, of the situation. You know, and and you could quite have easily penalised people. You know. For, for a, a weak signal, and, and that seems completely unreasonable, um, um, I'm sure. And there are other examples of this, like um, like the Compass stuff in America, and using it for like law enforcement and and recidiv recidivism, recidivism. Um, so there are design decisions that we need to make. You know, when we find this stuff in data, when we um, you know have this fabulous kind of new ability, we have to then design something which is useful. Yeah. But to James's point about values, actually, that's also really, it's a critical ongoing discussion that I think needs to be had openly, because unless we understand the values of where people are coming from, not just from what they say, but from how they behave, whether those two things align, it, it, it is very hard to know on onto what some of those decision-making processes are built. You know, and people do have different values. You know, uh, and that's okay. We can't just say universally, you know, th this is good and this is bad. There is a scale by by which people fall on, you know, on on that um, position. So, for me, I think understanding where companies, and this is maybe where companies have an opportunity to be really clear about what their intent is, and then are, are open to being challenged on whether they are being true to their values? Are they accountable mm -hmm. to the values that they state? You know, Google famously, you know, do no evil. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, again, debate, but at, at least that's a, you know, a statement of intent. Um, and then when, when you've got those values clear, then obviously people can make a, a more meaningful judgment against their stated values. Mm -hmm.